Welcome to season two of Robbie Burns and Friends. This season is all about my brand new book, Digital Organization Tips for Music Teachers, which is first in the Prestissimo series, a series of technology tip books for music educators, published by Oxford University Press. Each episode, I will discuss one chapter of the book with an expert on that subject. For example, on the episode about note-taking, I will chat with a music education specialist who is an expert on note-taking. The goal of the podcast is to offer complimentary material, not simply a regurgitation of the content in the chapter being discussed. Think of these as kind of like a B-side of each chapter of the book. Or even better yet, a counterpoint, complete with meta-discussion and even an extension of the ideas already in the book into new territory as provided by the experience of the guest. All right, that's enough of that. Here to talk about the concept behind my book, the Prestissimo series, and chapter one, series editor, Richard McCready. So the book, it, Digital Organization Tips for Music Teachers, is part of the Prestissimo series. Right. Um, which is, you might be able to explain this a little bit more concisely than I can, but it's a, a di- series of um, brief and digestible tips that are related to the field of music technology, but that are intended to introduce um, some sort of music technology topic to the general music educator in a way in which um, the technologies described are kind of bite-sized and very accessible, very easy to pick up the book and take something from it that you can integrate into whatever type of teaching context you might be involved in. Sure. The uh, the impetus for the series really came because of the, the growth of music technology and also technology in music. And uh, one of the things that many music technology educators noticed uh, was the number of people that really, really need some help with what they need to do in their classroom and what they are expected to do in their classroom with technology. And we're at a curious point where there's a lot of people who have been teaching for uh, for a number of years who do not feel prepared for the technology that they need in the classroom and the technology that they're going to be teaching to their students. Maybe it's uh, quite a few years since they were at uh, college studying music education. Uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the, the the technology is just coming along faster than they can keep up with. And uh, so we find that when people are looking at help with music technology, uh, we're getting a wide assortment of questions. Some people are needing help with recording. Some people are needing help with notation software. Some people are needing help with organizing sheet music, digital sheet music, and navigating the new uh, the new world of online sheet music and also online recordings. Uh, some people are needing help with uh, some software that's used uh, for practice rooms, such as Finale, Smart Music, and those sorts of things. And so everybody has has different requests uh, as regards what they need to learn uh, to feel equipped in their job. And we realized that even though a number of us have written books about music technology, there is no one book that really covers it all, because it's become such a huge subject. So we came up with the idea of the Prestissimo series, uh, which is on the outset going to be about 10 volumes, Uh, but we'll be finished when we're finished. So (laughs) we don't know what the last volume in the series is, whether it be 10, 12, 15, whatever. We'll just keep going as we see the the need for people to to have this information. And so the idea is, as you mentioned, that it is a a book of tips which are easily digestible. We want books that uh, any music teacher can just pick up and dip into and find the information which they need at the specific moment at which they need it. Uh, so we don't something want something which is intimidating by its size, we want something which is casual and uh, really speaks to the music educator and also doesn't insult the music educator by including, you know, your typical first 40 pages of how to read music and other things that you will find usually on the market. We know that our music educators are very smart. We know that they are trained to teach music and do incredible things. We want to make it easier for them then to to absorb the modern tools and to uh, employ them in their classrooms. So that's really what the Prestissimo series uh in tries to do it's that's what we envisioned it as and uh, hopefully we will be successful by the time we are through a number of volumes yeah 
that sums it up pretty well. You know, I always think about technology uh, at my own interest in technology. You know, you grow to a certain point where you, you get so highly involved with it that it does sort of take on um, a value in of itself. You know, I, I love, um, for example, you know, watching the latest Apple keynote and seeing what are the cool new features I'm going to get in my phone. Um, but that sort of all started from the perspective of someone who is just looking for a tool to make the part of my job um, that was meaningful to me less stressful. Uh, and, you know, so to me, it's, it always started with like, how do I get focused on the parts of my job that engage me, which mm -hmm. are relational skills, musical skills, um, classroom management skills, never anything like paper or, and, you know, I love composition, but not so much necessarily the act of um, getting ideas out on paper or into a computer. Um, and so technology, while I think it, you know, there does tend to be uh, an ever-growing trend where music technology is, is a content area in many schools, um, you know, technology is really for every music teacher. Yes. And that's, you know, I, that's why I love the concept of the series so much. Um, yeah. And I think I, you, you articulate that very well in your own introduction to the book about how your interest in music technology really allowed you to grow as a first year music teacher uh, into getting your first job and how it was over that time that you began to really develop this, uh, this skill of digital organization, which enabled you to become a better teacher. I think for everybody, there are things that uh, technology will do to help them become a better teacher and allow them to focus on the job that they have always wanted to do, which is to teach music. Uh, so each of the each of the books will you know we're, we're looking at an expert in the field uh, who has actually chosen this particular path along their own uh, music education uh, path. <laughs> I knew I used I used the word path in the sentence twice, but that's but 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 what I mean is that each of the people that is right are writing the books are people that have found their own way into technology as music teachers. Uh, I myself I I I. I really love digital audio workstations. Uh, I really loved working with those from the mid-1980s. Uh, when uh, MIDI started to be able to be programmed in computers, I, I loved developing compositions that way. So my home suit, as it, well, as it were, uh, home field, I should say, strong suit, and mix my metaphors beautifully there. My strong suit has always been things like Pro Tools and Ableton Live and GarageBand. Uh, whereas there's others whose strong suit is notation software. They were people that naturally gravitated towards notation software. And, of course, there will be a book later in the series about notation software and, and what that can do for music teachers. Uh, and, of course, there will be a volume on recording. Uh, we work with Ron Kearns, uh, who is himself a music educator that, uh, through his career, loved to... Uh, record music and to get good at it and what he did through his career as a music educator was get himself into professional studios and learn to record and to produce uh, along with incredible people with the result that the recordings he did of his own band in his own school were incredible so he brought that experience of loving recording uh, into the classroom with him and uh, so we were able to ask him to write a, a book uh, on recording uh, which will be book two in the series, uh, a book on recording with an emphasis on what it means for, for an educator, which is, it, it's a really wonderful thing that we have these great educators that are able to do that. You know, when talking to Ron about certain things, you know, I, it, there are some funny things that happen when you are a music teacher and you have to record a concert. You find yourself in a gym with a very, very noisy air conditioning system or you find yourself having to record outside on the windiest of days. And uh, these are challenges which only music teachers really have and which only music teachers really know how to solve. So having Ron on that is incredible. You yourself being able to do uh, book one has been remarkable because, again, you have the uh, the knowledge of, of working with technology within the band, never having the band actually stop playing while you're actually organizing. You've got your seating chart on your stand. You've got all your scores on your stand. You're able to annotate. You're able to grade kids. You're able to keep your to-do list going, your calendar. Everything is sitting on your music stand, and the band is never actually stopping playing. So that's a remarkable thing that we want to be able to encourage others to do. Uh, book three, we have a couple of authors uh, 
who were very, very interested in technology in the practice room. And uh, so they themselves uh, really focus on how to improve students' individual time and how to uh, keep that organized and keep that progressing at a very fast pace. And so we were able to convince uh, those two people, wonderful people, wonderful educators again, to write a book on uh, practice tips in the in in the classroom in the I mean technology tips in the practice room, and then the fourth book which we're looking at right now, uh, we are trying to go to contract on this one. Dr. Peter Perry came to us with an idea of using technology with the large ensemble, uh, a little different of attack from book one, which is your book, uh, but looking at all the wonderful. Uh, things there are that can enable you to rehearse better. There are things that you can bring into the classroom which will just enhance your rehearsal. So we're looking uh, there at technology tips for the large ensemble. Looking right now maybe at five and six um, digital audio workstation tips. We're looking at maybe notation software tips. So we have all these ideas right now. We're just looking for the, for the authors. Um, so that we can find somebody whose real expertise and whose real love of music technology is this particular area of music technology. And then we should have some, uh, some great volumes that people can use and read. Yeah, it's so awesome. I, I think that the, all of these topics just jump out at music teachers. You know, I, I, I have to say, like, I, I didn't expect that, um, you know, what my book is primarily focusing on was going to be something that was going to resonate with people. And, you know, and I thanks to you for sort of helping me to discover that this niche was actually uh, that I was really sitting on something with this. But, you know, for me, some of these these nerdy workflows like, oh, well, in one tap, I can create a clean seating chart for my daily band rehearsal and have a score up on the page. You know, this seems like just sort of such a bizarre niche thing to me. But in reality, you look at that and, and you think, you know, this is addressing a real need that most music teachers can immediately look at just even the title and think to themselves, oh, my goodness, like, I, I have to have this. Right. And Yeah, absolutely. And there are wonderful things that are going to just enhance their learning so much. One of the things I, I, I love is you have at one point a discussion of being able to uh, like a YouTube video and it immediately goes to your Evernote, which I love that, you know, you can be so, so that you can set it up in your computer so that when you're watching a YouTube video, you just press like and it's, it's got a workflow which then creates a note for that in Evernote. So many times we, we watch YouTube and we like something and then we forget the next morning when we're supposed to tell the kids what it was that we were watching. We've completely forgotten what it was, such as the nature of the Internet. You get lost a lot of times. But uh, some of those workflow ideas I think are really going to help teachers a lot just do things that they didn't know they needed to know how to do. Um, th these are all sorts of new skills which I think is just going to uh, enhance their teaching and is going to make some wonderful things happen for them. Awesome. It's cool to hear some of the future ideas, too. I, I hadn't heard quite as many of these uh, topics that you're already kind of looking at down the pipeline. It's very, very cool to hear. Yeah, like I said, it's such a disparate thing uh, and, and something we have discovered just over the last four to five years at conferences, particularly at conferences for the you know Technology Institute for Music Educators. Uh, when Technology Institute for Music Educators started, uh, when time started, uh, goodness knows, 20 years ago or something, I'm not so sure, everything was really just notation software and recording. And the early time support that was there was for these uh, things, how to use simple digital audio, or sequencing software, really. It wasn't even digital audio workstation software, but how to use simple sequencing software such as Windjammer, uh, how to... Uh, create a score in early versions of Finale. I think time actually started before Sibelius was even around. And how to do recordings, simple recordings. And we really had those three things, as well as just an, you know electronic instruments such as keyboards and stuff like that. Knowledge of those sorts of things. So music technology, it seemed at the time, was a very finite subject. And then each time I've gone to conference particularly the national conference over the last few years, I have just been amazed at the 
the assortment and variety of sessions which are showing the extent of where music technology is going and seeing people go into these sessions uh, by the hundreds. And I think it's, it's remarkable that this is happening and that music technology has become so disparate. And uh, so we certainly have plenty of material for more than 10 volumes uh, to be getting at stuff which is right at the heart of what people are looking for, particularly those people that are going to time conferences and, and checking out the technology sections of their state conference, such as our Maryland MEA conference. Our technology sessions there are becoming more disparate and more interesting all the time. Uh, so it's just a wide open field. You know, I think 20 years ago, when a lot of us started to get together and discuss music technology, we're, we were kind of amongst the first in our field, and we were all doing the same thing. You know, we were all teaching a bit of sequencing, we were teaching a bit of synthesis, and we were teaching a bit of notation, but a lot of us were, you know, more into the electronic sounds than the notation, because for a lot of us, you know, notation software is just a 21st century version of doing a 19th century tool. Um, but we have, you know, grown to the point where we see all these amazing things that we do, and many of us do naturally, and which, which other people are expected to do in their classroom. And uh, it, it's actually a joy to be able to do a series like this so that people can get the help that they want, and uh, we can get that great information into their hands. Excellent. Wow. Well, I, th I feel like we set that up pretty well. The uh, the series the series that is um, should we yeah. should we talk a little bit about what chapter one sort of sets up in digital sure. organization tips? Absolutely. So, all right. Well, again, this is uh, this little mini series known as season two is going to dive into a chapter every episode and chapter one um, of digital organization tips for music teachers is mostly set up sort of exploring how what what my journey was which you hit, touched on just a little bit um why this book is necessary um what it is and isn't and then sort of taking a look at um the metaphor that's going to sort of carry throughout the book and how to best approach the material um and and those you know and I'm just going through it heading by yeah. heading so uh just a little bit of my story i mean you you talked a little bit about it um you know, I had um, my, my after I finished grad school, I took a year off. It was difficult. It was a difficult time to find work in music education, and um, I took a lot a year off to do a lot of long term sub positions. And I, I found myself in this position where uh, I was, um, you know, not so much engaged with the schools I was long-term subbing at in that I were, was at meetings uh, during my planning periods or, you know, not, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily um, responsible for the breadth of things that the teacher I was filling in for was. So I, I found myself with a lot of free time in between classes. And, uh, you know, it was at this time that I had not even that long ago bought my first Mac and using the Mac to be productive was kind of a new area for me. But, you know, having just uh, done grad school, I just sort of started to get into like note taking and file management and how to best organize myself in, uh, in, you know, as a student. And I was kind of learning to take this to the next level. Um, I was also involved at the time with a cello rock quartet that I was doing some right. arranging for. And um, I was, you know, spending a lot of my free time doing arranging and coaching for various ensembles in our school district. And I just found myself needing to learn a lot of this software. You know, it started with Sibelius. Mm -hmm. um, I, I dabbled a little bit with Pro Tools. And, uh, and then I started to get into, you know, things like, well, how do I get different devices in my life to talk to each other? And, um, and this is around the time also that I bought my first iPhone. So, you know, I'm thinking about things like, well, how do I get access to my files when I'm not next to my computer? And, um, you know, how do I check my email from multiple devices? You know, this is very early days of mobile smartphones. And, uh, you know, this sort of journey ex extends itself into me doing a lot of watching of tutorials during free planning periods and learning a lot of software, things like Photoshop and Lightroom and Pro Tools and... Um, 
you know, eventually I landed my first full-time teaching job and, um, you know, it was at, at a point in my, you know, life where I was start, sort of starting to get these devices to talk to each other. And it was at this time that I treated myself to an iPad mm-hmm. you know, it was my present to myself for my, my first gig ever. And, <laughs> and now this was this third device that had, it was almost like a piece of paper and um, I wanted that one to talk to my other devices. And I, I kind of wanted to start to see every screen that I had in my life as just a different window into the same information. And okay. the iPad in particular as sort of like this representation of like a, you know, a screen that's shaped like a piece of paper, it, while also having all of a sudden all of this new administrative responsibility in my first teaching job, Um, I started to look at how do I get rid of all of those parts of my teaching job that don't feel like making music and, you know, how do I automate them or at least uh, get some of that friction out of the way. And the rest, I guess, is is history. I mean, you got to read the book to learn specifically where that journey led me. But, um, you know, I would say that the book itself uh, sort of continues through um, a variety. I guess we could say each chapter is a type of data that you can capture and manage digitally. So, I mean, starting with things like note taking, which traditionally we think of doing with paper and pen, um, you know, things like task management. Also, we kind of think about, you know, writing down tasks using a physical agenda or a calendar to keep track of our our date, due dates and deadlines and things. Um, And then this, you know, moving towards things like then into musical territory, like audio files and scores, and right. how all that kind of fits into the equation as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I like how you talk about getting rid of anything that doesn't feel like music making. I feel that's so important, uh, because people seem to think that technology and music are exclusive, which they're not. You know, that when you're standing on the podium and you're conducting, that that is a moment which is ab- uh, away from technology. And so people get very much into two different worlds about what's going on. But um, in actual fact, technology, which you are using, is able to enhance your music making, which is which is quite remarkable. Uh, but I, lo- I love the idea of just focusing on, on what is making music and allowing the technology to, uh, t- to sink into the background so that the focus is what is making music, but you're being supported all the time by the organization that you're doing, which is allowing you ultimately more time on the podium. Uh, I mean, I have seen a number of band groups where uh, band teachers and and also orchestra teachers and chorus teachers and guitar teachers and music tech teachers, and I've seen it in numerous places where where the kids are spending 15, 20 minutes just blowing through their instruments or, 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 or doing stuff while the teacher is getting organized with field trip permission slips or um, uniform requests and all sorts of the, you know, the useless ephemera of, of the job uh, that you, you sit there and you really wish you had a personal assistant to do that. Meanwhile, the first 20 minutes of your rehearsal are taken up by that, and the poor kids are just kind of warming up and waiting for you to start, and you can't get started. And so being able to organize that while you're actually standing on the podium enhances the music making you can do uh, in, in a wonderful way. You know, I, I, I love the idea of getting field trip permission slips from the kids and just having a scanner right there by where you're standing. The kid comes up to the podium uh, right at the beginning of rehearsal, hands you a form, you just scan it. It's done. <laughs> and you can get on with, you know, put it to the side and, and off you go. And, and, I, and I think that's remarkable. And I think once people really buy into this, they are gonna, they're going to go for it in, in, in a big way. I think people are really going to find that this is going to help them in keeping the music going so that all those non-musical things which you're expected to do as a music teacher don't get in the way of making music. Sure. And I think that that's a, definitely a, an important theme also is that in the little planning time we have off the podium, we're really expected to be fulfilling the responsibilities of so many um, different areas, each of which could be considered a full-time job. Um, Ranging, you know, financial secretary to trip planner to arranger, composer. I mean, those things feel like making music, but certainly um, they don't always uh, feel like they directly support the engagement with students. Right. 
And even then, you know, we are a, a particular subject where if a kid stops by during their lunchtime or something and needs help with something, we usually drop everything we're doing just to help them. I mean, it's great that a kid comes by and says, you know, Mr. Burns, I need help with measures 8 through 13 in, in this particular piece. And, I mean... You can't just say, you can't come to me right now. I'm trying to organize papers. I'm trying to organize my right. desk. <laughs> you know, that's the time that you say, okay, I'll drop what I'm doing. I'm going to help you with those measures. And then I'm going to get back to what I was, you know, to, to my non-important work. Uh, later. Of course, it's important work, but it's not important compared to the actual making music and helping that child uh, be better as a musician. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're explaining it really well. I mean, it's just the the entire idea of minimizing those other responsibilities um, and streamlining them in a way where, you know, it's funny. It's like once the, one of the goals of the book is that once you learn to use the software that I'm going over in this book, that some of it is going to feel so natural and easy to use that you almost feel um, it's almost feels as natural as playing your own instrument. Right. Um, I mean, using a keyboard shortcut to capture a quick task into a task management app. I mean, that is, you know, it's like doing a fingering <laughs> on a saxophone. It's yeah. just so quick. And the tools are so, you know, getting to what your intent or what your goal is, is so, uh, you know, so few steps with some of the software that you do get to a point where it does feel almost streamlined. Um, right. And that's almost where that point comes for someone like me who's sort of gone off the deep end where you almost sort of start to appreciate this technology for its own sake. It almost starts to be fun um, and finding new ways to make tasks that you don't like easier almost becomes a fun kind of thing in of itself. Almost mm -hmm. like, a, you know, how do I solve this problem in the most creative way? And, you know, how can the technology help me to make this part of my job less difficult? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I guess I should explain what the the book sets out to accomplish and what it doesn't, because there are a lot of pieces of software, and I, I should say services too, that are covered. And the book, I, I would not describe the book as so much a how to use the software and the services. Right. Um, more so how I am solving music teaching types of problems with the way I approach this software. Absolutely. I so, mean, you can get a how-to for almost any software from the maker's website, uh, but your approach really sorts of that as, as regards how this works for a music teacher, which is, which is what our music teachers need to see. Sure. So just to give I me mean, a couple of examples for someone who's just listening and hasn't read any of it, I mean, like, Take like the primary note-taking application I discuss in the chapter on taking notes is Evernote. But it, rather than going into depth on like which buttons to click and which menus to dig through to access the features, it's going to be discussing some an overview of the features. But primarily, here's how I made um, going taking my band to an adjudicated event. Uh, how I organized all the data related to that event in Evernote. Absolutely. Here's how I clipped the feedback forms from the judges into a note. Here's how I embedded audio recordings of our rehearsals into a note and, you know, tag them by date, you know, that, that kind of idea and, and sort of attack going through an overview of each piece of technology first, but then, you know, very soon after, um, sort of offering what I call workflows on how those technologies are solving the problems specific to music teaching. Absolutely. And the, uh, the, the other books will be the same. You know, the, the notation software will not be a how to use Sibelius. It will not be a how to use MuseScore or Notion or NoteFlight or Finale. Uh, it, it'll be examples of how notation software can enhance your program. What you can do to, do, to, to be better by being able to use notation software. You know, such, such as the idea of being able to easily transpose parts. Uh, that that's that's something wonderful uh, to be able to do. You know, you have parts for clarinet, and some kids show up, and the only thing they have is an A clarinet. Well, what do you do? Well, <laughs> you can actually transpose those parts immediately for that kid that just happens to have an A clarinet because that's what their grandpa bought them. Uh, that sort of thing can can you know 
despite the fact they're going to be in a really awkward key to play the clarinet in. But you know, it's those those sorts of ideas will be will be very easily found in that sort of book. You, the digital audio workstation book, which we hope to, will not be a how to use Pro Tools. You can go buy a book on how to use Pro Tools. I can steer you in the right direction for that. You know, it will not be a book on how to use how how to work logic. Besides, by the time you write one of those books, they're out of date. Uh, but rather, it'll be ideas for what the digital audio workstation can do to enhance uh, to enhance your teaching. That's a that's a really important thing. I'm glad you addressed is the, you know, just how, I mean, software is you know changing more rapidly every day. I mean, now we have we have operating system updates for most of the major platforms on an annual basis now. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. how to you know type an email on uh, the mail app for uh, OS 10 is, you know, different every year. And, um, but what email might do for you are a principle of, you know, using it, you know, using a power feature of an email client or like how to write a good email. Those are things that when you look at them in a context um, with, you know, with a practical application, you sort of take that meaning out and make it more timeless almost by being able to insert that into any future context. Absolutely. You know, email specifically, it it's, makes me think of something else that I, I feel like the book touches on, which is almost the non-technological <laughs> principles behind these types of activities. Like to use the notes example again, like what are notes what is the purpose of taking notes, whether you do it on a computer or with a paper and a pen, really what makes effective note taking? Or when, you know, I go into the topic of task management, like what makes a task a task and an event, a, something that goes on a calendar, like yeah. what types of philosophies make that distinction helpful to someone who's trying to better manage their time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction that you draw there. Uh, you know that a, a to-do list is different from a calendar. I, I think that's very important that there are specific apps that will help you uh, to to organize that. And I, I think the metaphor becomes clear as people certainly work through uh, that first chapter uh, on on the, on those sorts of ideas. Sure. Yeah, because I mean it's. You, you don't want to use the wrong app for the for the wrong purpose, like you know, using your calendar to write your grocery list on. Uh, and that, and I guess people can get confused. I mean, I've certainly seen people get confused by by trying to use uh, a piece of software for something that it was not intended for. For example, I've seen many teachers who try to create uh, parts for uh, an orchestra or a band by using the notation editor in GarageBand. Hmm. It, it was never meant for that. It, it, it wasn't envisioned as a notation editor, but when music teachers sometimes see, oh, there's notation in GarageBand and I have it on my Mac, I can save money by not having to buy Sibelius or Finale or any of the other products. I can do it in uh, GarageBand. And then they get frustrated because, of course, it doesn't do what they want it to do. Sure. Uh, it, it's not what it was there for. So uh, using, for example, your... Uh, notes app as your calendar is probably not the best thing to do with it. No, my my other favorite that I see all the time is people who use PowerPoint or Keynote to make graphics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which actually it is honestly quite good at doing all things considered. But uh, <laughs> it's just, and that might be maybe that's another theme because I, I cover a lot of apps in this book, and, and you know I think I've grown, and this is just my personal taste. I've grown to appreciate that many many small tools that are good at one thing um, it can can be more beneficial if you're using just the right tool for each job. And, um, you know, that can definitely be, you know, I know that we, many educators have something like Outlook installed on their computer where they're managing notes, tasks, email, calendar, and all in the same place. And, um, you know, for me, and I think one of the themes of the book, too, expresses that you know, having just the right little utility application for that one little thing can sometimes uh, help you get your job done more directly and more efficiently. Absolutely. Yep. 
So, uh, you know, exploring this metaphor, I mean, I guess you said we, maybe we should cover the outline. I mean, there are about 10, 11 chapters in the book. And, you know, we said that there's a chapter on notes. There's a chapter on um, just general productivity basics, things like web browsers, mm -hmm. email, calendar, and tasks. Um, right. There's a chapter on cloud drives, meaning specifically like Dropbox, iCloud Drive, Google Drive. Yeah, very useful. Some people just don't seem to even understand what the cloud is yet. Um, so this is a very useful chapter for people to get used to that. And uh, I mean, it's so useful to be able to use a cloud drive like Dropbox to be able to move your stuff between your home computer and your school computer and the computer that happens to be in the classroom that you teach one particular class. And, you know, for example, you may have band in the band room, but you teach piano in the piano room and there's a different computer, but you need to have access to files. So it's, it's so useful to be able to know that there is out there a cloud drive that you can use. There's an extra server that you can just put your stuff on. It, it, it's great to know how to be able to access that no matter whether you're using Dropbox or you're using Box or you're using uh, Google Drive. I think those are the three you went into, right? Yeah, Google Drive, iCloud Drive, Dropbox, and then and then a, like a, a brief paragraph on about five other competitors. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, scanning. Scanning, yeah. Oh, well, there's a whole chapter on PDFs. Um, and that's after the scanning one, yeah. Scanning, then PDFs. Scanning. Which, by the way, is the right way around. Um, and then, of course, PDFs. A lot of people get a little confused with PDFs. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and I love the way you add some, um, some apps here which are not as expensive as getting the full Acrobat and that sort of thing, that editing PDFs is something that is certainly possible and getting easier. Uh, so being able to use PDFs and be, to be able to mark them up as well. I, I love the way you've used some things there uh, to be able to do that. That really a, a PDF, in, it should be a portable document format. But so many people only see it, uh, they're scared of it because they think it's a completely locked document format. It's just a document that can move very easily between uh, different operating systems. So I, I this, this chapter kind of... Uh, unlocks a lot of the mystery there on what's going on. And then we go on to working with scores, which is, of course, wonderful. And I'm sure a lot of people will want to really be able to to enhance their working with scores, whether that be full scores or lead sheets or, or those sorts of things that they have. And, and having everything in your uh, iPad, of course, is just so incredibly the, useful. You sure? Yeah, the, the score... Li the software that fills this kind of score library and annotation category, things like Fourscore and the Unreal Book, these are like, I, I think of these as the apps that really make my, my iPad an indispensable part of my work. I mean, these are the types of software that, like there's no Fourscore app on my Mac. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an iPhone version, but I mean, that's the kind of software that's like desktop class tablet software where what you do with it makes perfect sense on the form factor of a tablet and really doesn't make any sense anywhere else. Yeah. And I like how you bring in also a, an actual fully functional notation software there with Notion, which is so good because its iPad uh, app is so good. Um, I mean, you have for Finale and Sibelius, you have uh, readers for them, which enables you to create a score, you can create a score in Sibelius, export it, pick it up on your iPad in Scorch and be able to read it, that's great. But Notion enables you to continue to edit on your iPad, which is a very, very useful uh, way to work. Sure, I, you know, I thought about not including any notation software at all, but the thing that really won me over with, um, with Notion is, is it just really keeps within that theme of continuing your work on any device, being productive, um, well, and elim that. eliminating that friction, you know, and Notion just syncs your, your documents across all of your yeah. different devices over the cloud. It's got the desktop version, the tablet version. Right. And, and what the, I, the Dropbox integration is perfect. Oh my gosh. Yes. And the, it's even got iCloud integration. You don't even have to set it up or log in yeah. to your, your account. And one of the things I love is in keeping with the theme of uh, an iPad as a piece of paper, um, the Apple Pencil support, if you are using an iPad Pro, allows you to actually just hand write your notation and it will translate it right on the screen in front of you almost magically, it seems. Beautiful. Very, very yeah. cool.
so then we're into audio management, which is great, how to organize your MP3s and how to use uh, Spotify and iTunes and um, Google Music, uh, which is one of my favorites, certainly. Um, and, and that's great. And then you're into photo management, which I love, you know, being able to, because we do manage to have so many photos of the kids and so many videos of the kids to be able to organize, organize those rather than lose them around various flash drives is, is a really uh, great thing. I, I, I love the way you managed to get a picture of Mary in figure 9.13. That was really <laughs> sneaky. So... It's a lovely picture of her, by the way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then we're into, you know, you have your miscellaneous productivity apps at the end, some of the fun things that are there. I mean, like Better Snap Tool, which is one that I love myself. And you go, even go into things like One Password and Backblaze, which are, are just nice kind of like little extras that, uh, that, that, that keep you going. And then for the uh, then for the overachiever, you get into automation and advanced workflows. So that's kind of like a prize for anybody that makes it that far in the book. And like, I want to learn more. I want to learn more. I th and I think you know the automation is just extraordinary for what it can do for for people. Uh, to, you know, to be able to do complex tasks with just one keystroke. I think will help a lot of people out when they uh, when they get into that. I think that's very exciting. And I think it's fun to even set up your own workflows and to see to see how smart you can do. Next, I'm going to have to do you a, get get you do a chapter on how to set up workflows in Max. Not not extensively. It, it, it's quite amazing what you can do in Max for live. Uh, but it's it's you, you can do so much automation and stuff. And I mean, it's it's ideally there for music. But our dear friend VJ Manzo actually used it to program his terrarium for when he's away at conferences. So. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's it's, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's crazy. So, well, and you know, it's funny. Is so, Apple Script is a language that works with, um, you know, many many professional applications that are available on OS X um, are scriptable with Apple Script. But you know, a lot of um, professional music software does not have support. For Apple Script, not even GarageBand or Logic, which yeah. is made by Apple. So it would be interesting, you know. And I know that um, Mac. I'm pretty sure that Macs and Ableton Live do not have any support for Apple Script. But there seems to to me that there's a, a huge potential there to, you know, even even as I'm recording this um, this podcast episode, I'm thinking there's like ten or eleven tasks that I am sure I will do in Logic to edit this file that could easily be automated because they are not difficult tasks at all. They're just very time consuming. Correct. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. So that's, that's just so funny to the, the terrarium. <laughs> yep. And not at all surprising that he would be the type of person who would figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, completely. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I guess there's, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying desperately to keep every episode this season around 45 minutes. Okay. And um, there is one other thing in the first chapter that I did want to touch on, and I feel like you know this this little mini series. I feel like is the goal of it is to serve as a little bit of a counterpoint to the book. And you know, I know in this particular episode we've talked a lot about specifically what the content of chapter two is, but I, I would like in future episodes, um, you know, I'm going to be interviewing a lot of different guests who I consider to be experts on that subject, so that. Right. My goal is that there's going to be um, t territory that's covered in spoken word that either supplements uh, or even offers a al totally alternate perspective to what I cover in the book. Good. Um, but anyway, throughout all this, there is one thing in chapter one that I feel like is important to mention, and that is that there is a little bit of, uh, you can even tell if you're just listening to this conversation, that there's this little bit of Apple bias in the book. And right. I, I wouldn't even call it bias, but... Um, you know, I felt I felt the need to just address this in spoken word as well as I do in the book too. But you know, I, I think that um, there is certainly a leaning in the field of both music and education towards Apple software platforms, and you know, I, I feel like the software is ubiquitous enough, you know, in the profession that I when I focus on something that's on an Apple product only, I feel like um, 
it's it's likely the case that a teacher will have access to it. And when I don't, yes. I feel like I'm providing examples that will give someone who's on an Android or a Windows device enough um, inspiration that they might be able to either take one of the alternate options that I've provided or even just try to research for themselves how they might accomplish that, find that a similar solution to the same problem, but just with a different branded software. Well, what we, what we see in the technology world is that as soon as one company comes up with something cool, another company will try to find a way to make that happen. So once you have a great app on an Apple device, it won't be long before somebody tries to do something similar uh, on an Android or, or, or something else. And, and once there's something incredible on, win, on Windows, it'll eventually get ported to the Mac. Or once there's something great on Mac, it'll become available on, on the PC. So all of these things should even out. Uh, yes, a lot of music teachers certainly are very familiar with Apple products. Uh, we've used them for years in music education, uh, particularly music technology education, because their ability to handle audio data is so superior to the PC. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think you have, have, have brought up so many good examples of, of what is available on other platforms that I don't think it'll, uh, if somebody doesn't happen to have Apple products, I don't think they will balk and and think that the book is not for them. Uh, the book is going to uh, certainly make anybody's workflow easier, uh, whether they're using Apple or not. Totally. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we covered the first chapter. Yeah, I think we got well. a good introduction there to the to the series for you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, gonna, you know, some chapters will be split into a couple episodes, but you know, otherwise, look forward people listening to about a chapter, uh, an episode per chapter, and um, I, as, as much of a regular um, posting schedule as I can possibly find within myself to do. And <laughs> the book, I feel okay. like I can finally post this episode. You know, the books are making it to people's houses. Right. So That's great. All right. All right. This has been very fun. Yeah. Always good to talk to you. For sure. Yeah. All right. So have a fun week in school. Absolutely. You as well. And I, hopefully I'll get to chat with you again soon. That would be great. All right. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thanks for doing this. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. You can learn more about Richard McCready by following him on Twitter at R-A-M-C-C-R-E-A-D-Y. That's at R-A McCready. And you should be sure to check out and buy his brand new book, Make Your Own Music, a creative curriculum using music technology. See you next time.